Good morning. It's Sunday, May 17th. We're reading through the Bible. Our Old Testament reading that you're going, going to be getting into is going to tell us the story of the rise of Hezekiah. Hezekiah becomes a uh, godly king here who does a lot to reform things and cleanse the temple. Uh, there's lots of things there that need to be fixed. The minds of the people need to stop focusing on things that have become objects of veneration for them. Uh, remember back in Moses' day when they got bit by the snakes, by the snakes in the, in the wilderness, God told Moses to construct that staff, that stick, that pole with a snake on it. That's become a symbol, by the way, of the medical profession today. You still see it everywhere on ambulances and um, uh, elevators and hospitals. Uh, that became an object of worship for Israel. And uh, this was a bad thing and it had to be removed. And uh, thankfully Hezekiah did that work in 2 Kings chapter 18, uh, reminds us that good things can often become a stumbling block. I think of why God has done this throughout church history, early on in church history, as some of the things that have become or could have become relics as they were called in the Roman Catholic Church, as objects of veneration uh, in Christ's ministry, uh, we, we don't have. And thankfully, they have been put away, as Hezekiah put away this uh, snake on a pole, as I like to call it. Hezekiah prays in chapter 19 uh, as the Assyrians are attacking. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, is coming after um, Judah now. He already taken out the northern tribes. And so, by God's grace, Hezekiah is delivered. Uh, Isaiah's ministry is all interwoven with Hezekiah's reign. You can read about that in the book of Isaiah, and you certainly see it here that he's prophesying about the fall of the southern kingdom, which would happen later on in chapter 25 of this book. But uh, all of that is to come. Hezekiah is hearing that really bad news. In John chapter 6, verses 22 through 44, the middle section of chapter 6 is our reading in John. Remember our reading yesterday, uh, Jesus had fed the 5,000, and now he tells them, listen, you now just have come back to me because you want a free lunch. And uh, again, much like that snake on a pole in the Old Testament, it's easy for us to focus on something that God has done and make that the object when the object should be something else. In this case, we ought to see Christ for who he is, not just the gifts that he can bring. And that's why he says, I'm the bread of life. If you, uh, you take, partake of me, you'll never hunger, which is a huge statement, by the way. Think about that. There's a ultimate fulfillment in Christ which we need not have an over-realized eschatology, as we call it, and that you think all of those benefits are here and now. Uh, we do hunger in many, many ways in this life, uh, even spiritually, because we see through a class dimly, as Paul put it, uh, we don't have the full effect of being in the presence of Jesus face to face with him. So we struggle. Even in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, I mean, Paul was despondent, despaired even of life. So we recognize we're going to have hard times. But ultimately, thankfully, uh, as the psalmist said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, which is the Hebrew word to chase down. It's going to come after you. And, and then at the end, it says, and surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's the ultimate hope. We will ultimately never hunger. That's the promise for those who trust in Christ in this life, that we will get to a place where all the aches and pains and the distance of separation in many ways from the personal presence of Christ and the kingdom that comes in its fullness will be completely fulfilled. And that's going to be great. Our community imperative is found in Philippians chapter 2 again, this time in verse 19, when Paul says, I hope that in the Lord Jesus to send you Timothy, send him to you soon, that I may be cheered by good news of you. And I think that's a helpful thing for us to remember the way that God can use good news to cheer our hearts. Now, yesterday we talked about rejoicing together, being glad and rejoicing together. Today, I just like the personal nature of Paul saying, I'm going to be encouraged uh, I'm going to be cheered in my own life as I hear news from you. So I would look around and see if you can take today uh, some assessment of things going on in other people's lives. And instead of saying, let's rejoice together, just find that sense of fulfillment that you would say, I want to be cheered today by the news and progress of things that have gone on in other people's lives. Even just to follow up on things you've been praying for, for instance, in the lives of other people. Ask them how it's going. Ask them what's happening. And as you get good news, take that and be enriched in your own heart. As this text says, be cheered by that. So the way I stated it, the community imperative, be cheered by good news from others. Be cheered by good news from others. All right. Thanks for listening today. We're going to be back tomorrow as we continue our reading through the Bible. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and we'll be back again tomorrow morning.